Hello again and welcome to chapter 20, World Climates and Global Climate Change. So in this chapter, we're going to look at what is climate and how it differs from weather, um, the different climate uh, systems in terms of how they, they interact with each other, the different spheres, we'll, we'll call them, and then sort of a global uh, classification for the various different climates, and then man's effect on climate as well. So there's a lot of uh, ground to cover in this chapter, so let's get going. So if you remember from chapter one, the climate involves a large amount of energy and moisture that interacts between the different spheres, which we talked about in chapter one. The atmosphere, obviously, you know, where the air and clouds are. The hydrosphere, which is the water, the groundwater, lakes, rivers, things like that, oceans. The geosphere, which is geology, the rocks. The biosphere is all the living uh, uh, organisms on Earth, trees, plants, humans, things like that, animals. And then the cryosphere, which is the water, but in solid form, like ice or snow, which plays a large uh, role as well. So here's an image of Earth's climate system. And you, hopefully you can recognize right away that this is a complex system. There's no one thing that dominates. They all play a role with each other. And just to use a couple of examples, you have how the ocean can change its circulation, which might affect the amount of precipitation or evaporation that takes place. So the, the hydrosphere is interacting with the atmosphere and the biosphere is interacting with the hydrosphere. And the, you know, it, they all are interrelated. They all play a role with each other depending on um, you know, how the sun is reflecting energy back up into space or how much is being absorbed or reflected, they all play a role with each other. So it's a very complex system. So if you look at this, obviously humans as well have a role in this in terms of things like land use and if you're burning for agriculture, cities play a huge role, so things like smog and the uh, urban island effect with heat. So it's it, there's a lot going on here. Now, we have different climates depending on where you are. So here in Wisconsin, we have a very, what's called a temperate climate. And we'll talk more about these as we go, but we have all four seasons here. But that isn't always the case depending on where you are. So there's two main things that you're looking at when you're talking about uh, climate, and that's temperature and precipitation. Sort of like the annual average of how much you get. If you're near the equator, you're gonna have probably more precipitation and a much higher average temperature. Here in Wisconsin, ours fluctuates quite a bit because we're in that temperate zone. We can get years of really hot uh, summers and cold winters or warm winters and cold summers or a lot of precipitation. Ours kind of varies um, quite a bit. There have been several attempts to classify climate systems for the entire earth. And the image that you see in this particular slide was first sort of devised by the ancient Greeks. So they divided it up into basically three zones. You have the very frigid zones at either end of the earth, sort of the temperate zone, and then the, what they call the torrid zone, where you have mostly summer all year long. And that, you know, again, it's simple, but it kind of still represents most of what's going on. However, there's new systems that sort of account for variability within each one of those zones to better explain what's going on depending on where you are on Earth. So the best known classification scheme is called the Koopen uh, classification scheme. It's the one that's most used and it uses mean monthly and annual values of temperature or precipitation to better um, uh, describe the type of uh, climate that's going on in a particular area. So let's take a look at that. It divides the world into climatic regions in a realistic way. So, you know, you, you, you expect jungles or, you know, equatorial uh, jungles and heat to be where it's supposed to be as opposed to, let's say, a desert or, a, you know, a cold temperate zone. Um, <clears throat> now, the boundaries were largely based on limits of certain plant associations. So, again, I mean, that makes sense. You're not going to have cactus uh, 
cacti growing in necessarily in a jungle. They, you know, they live, they thrive in desert regions, things like that. So they use these plant associations to help better delineate between one type of climate and another. So there's five principal groups. There's the humid tropical, makes sense, right? Especially if you're closer to the equator. You have dry climates, right? Deserts, things like that. Humid mid-latitude with mild winters, right? So for that, you could think of, if you're looking at the US, like the Southern US. Um, they'll get the occasional winter storm, but for the most part, it's mild. Then you got humid mid-latitude with severe winters. That's us in Wisconsin here. Um, and then we have the polar region. So those are the five main uh, categories, and then they sort of subdivide them from there. So A, C, D, and E are all defined on the basis of temperature characteristics. However, precipitation is the primary criterion for uh, the B group or the dry group, because depending on, you could still get rain, let's say in the desert, but it's still desert, so it belongs in the B group, but then they kind of subdivide that. Some areas get more rain than others, depending on where you are um, in sort of that dry group. So in this graphic, you can see the entire Koopen climate uh, zones of the world. And starting from the top, you have the humid tropical, which are the greens, the, you know, the, the dark green, the sort of the middle green, and then the pale green. And you can hopefully notice right away that these are mostly associated in and around the equator for the most part, right? Excuse my circle there. So those are found in the hot, uh, precip you know, hot, humid, tropical locations. And then they kind of go out from there, um, depending on sort of the topography of the land. So you can see in cent very central Africa here, that's where the hot, humid jungles are. And then they kind of branch out into the steppes in this, this uh, lighter green area. In Malaysia, this area over here in the west, or excuse me, in the east, <laughs> um, uh, that area is all hot and humid. It's all jungles over there. Then you get into the browns and tans, where that's what we call the dry zones. And again, that's based mainly on precipitation. So the lighter the color, the less precipitation you get. And you can see right away that the um, the the Sahara Desert here dominates a huge part of Northern Africa. So, oh, sorry about that, trying to get my marker thing here. So that's very hot, very dry desert. Doesn't rain a whole lot. You'll also notice that sometimes that's associated with mountain ranges like down here in South America. And then even up into the Rockies and into northern Canada or into Canada, where you have these massive grasslands, what we call steppes. It's S-T-E-P-P-E, -E, just like you would take a step in, when you're walking, but it's with two P's as opposed to uh, one P. And these are massive grasslands that just go on forever. There's a over here in Eurasia. There's a lot of that as well, and uh, those are very dry. Not necessarily deserts per se, but very dry grasslands. And then you get sort of the um, humid mid latitude. I'm looking at my other screen over here. Humid mid latitude, sort of the pinks, the yellows, and the uh, the the reds. And you can see those are sort of associated with other areas just outside the hot dry areas, especially here in the Mediterranean, and even southern U.S. has some of that. All right. And then we have the humid mid-latitude where we get winter. And you'll notice that's where we are, right in here, right? And Eastern Europe over here. So you get a, quite a bit of that in the Northern Hemisphere. You don't get almost any mid-latitude. You'll notice there's almost no blues in the Southern Hemisphere because there's not as much land mass and they get, uh, there's a lot more ocean influence there. That's why they don't get, there's almost no, no mid-latitude uh, severe winters in the Southern Hemisphere. There's just not enough land to, to allow for it. And then finally, you get the polar regions, obviously way up there, you know, way up in Northern Greenland, Canada, Northern Russia. So there, 
this is a really helpful classification scheme because it makes sense, right? As you, if you start from the equator and move out in both directions, you're going to get, start with those hot and humid, kind of morph into the dry desert climates, then sort of those mid-latitude uh, uh, humid and then mid latitude, you know, with the severe winters, then obviously then polar. So this makes sense, but it gives you a bit more descriptiveness in terms of what's going on in a particular location, as opposed to the slide I showed you earlier where there was only three zones pretty much. So that was sort of the starting point, you know, where you had the torrid zone, the temperate zone, and the frigid zone. This takes that and makes it much easier to understand because there are certain parts, you know, you can see like even in the equatorial regions, it's not all dark green. There's savannas. So it's still hot and humid. It just doesn't have sort of that quote unquote jungle type of um, rainforests. So let's start with the humid tropical climates or classification A. Here you have winterless climates. Boy, wouldn't we all like that, right? Where all the months are above 64 average, roughly average of 64 degrees Fahrenheit or 18 degrees Celsius. So these are the wet tropics, high temperatures and year round uh, rainfall, you know, rainforest, you know, thick lush vegetation. Um, but it's not exactly ex continuous around the equator, but it's, it, it is mostly around the equator. Um, and it's influenced by sort of these equatorial low pressures, low pressure systems, as we saw in an earlier chapter, I think it was chapter 16 or 18, I forget. Um, low pressure is what dominates sort of rain patterns. So when you have lots of low pressure systems, you get lots of rain. Now you have tropical wet and you have tropical dry. So wet tropics um, are, you know, like I said, with rainforest, then you have sort of the tropical deserts, which are like savannas, tropical grasslands. So they get seasonal rainfall, but it's always still hot. It just may not be as much rainfall to support, let's say, a uh, rainforest per se. So those were those lighter greens that you saw in that world map that are on either side of sort of the equatorial rainforests. Okay, so I have my camera turned off for this particular slide, and I wanted to show you the comparison of the tropical A-type climates. And you can see that there's, in the Peru example here, there's not a whole lot of variation in their temperature meaning that there it's hot all the time my line there isn't very good and they get lots and lots of precipitation which you can see here their dry season is in august uh which you know that's just the way their their weather stacks up so then if you move to the center one here in liberia again their temperature doesn't change that much it's pretty much always hot look at the average temperature there is about 86 degrees but look at the, the uh, difference in precipitation. So in January and February and March, they get very little precipitation. And then boom, it shoots way up in June, July. They get tons and tons, up to 23 inches of rain in June and July each. That's a lot of rain. And so then we come over to Australia. And again, for most of the year, it's pretty darn hot here. However, this is a bit of a, uh, even though it's in the, the A type, it's a drier A type. Um, and you could see that in the win their winter months or our winter months, their summer months, because this is the uh, Southern hemisphere, it gets, it's very wet in January, February, and March uh, somewhat. And then it drops off to almost nothing in what would be their winter months. It gets very dry there. So here's three examples of A-type climates, but with very different rain and temperature patterns. Okay, so let's turn our attention now to the dry climates. Dry climates where you have evaporation that exceeds precipitation, so there's a constant water deficiency. You get a desert, right? There's not enough water to sustain everything because it's, it's evaporating and there's just not enough rainfall to uh, to sustain it. So 
you know, typically the, the, the boundaries for these types of areas are from annual a average annual precipitation, average annual temperature, and then seasonal distribution of precipitation. So even in sort of dry climates, you can have a period where you might have more rain than others. And then there's some places on Earth, like the Atacama Desert, where it may not rain a single drop for 50 to 100 years. It all just depends on where they are um, relative to the land masses around them and the climate patterns near them. We'll talk more about that as we go along, too. So we have two types of uh, dry climates. You have the arid and, and or desert, and then the semi-arid or steppe. And I mentioned the steppe before. It's more humid, um, and they typically kind of outline the desert itself. So you can think, in a, in a nutshell, the desert is the sand, the dunes, the super hot, what you expect the desert to look like. And then sort of on the outside of that is you still get this arid climate, but it's enough, it has enough moisture to sustain, let's say, grasslands, but it's still very hot and dry. All right, so I have my camera turned off here. So here's some example of arid and semi-arid climates. And hopefully you can see that while there is a temperature difference with some of these, you can see at the bottom, like for example, in Cairo, Egypt, it's pretty much always warm. There's some variability there, you know, during um, the winter months, you know, but it's still pretty warm. It's in, the, you know, up mid to upper 60s. It gets really hot in the summer, obviously. The average is around 80. 80, 90 degrees, and that's the average. It can get a lot hotter there, I'm sure. But if you look at the look at the precipitation, there's very, very little precipitation here. Then you go over to Monterey, Mexico, which has a bit more variability in its precipitation, especially during the summer months, because of the wet, the, the different uh, weather patterns that it has coming across from west to east. It gets a bit more rain off of the uh, the Pacific Ocean. But the, the, the actual temperatures are relatively similar to Cairo, but it's just much more regulated by the oceans, being that it's closer to it. Then you have Nevada here, and Nevada, again, is a desert. It's a higher desert, and it gets very little precipitation all year long, similar to Cairo. But it has a much um, bigger variability in terms of its temperature range. It can get down to zero, but it go it can jump all the way up into June and July with an average of in the 80s. And if you've ever been to uh, uh, Nevada in the summer, it can get very, very hot in the sun out there, 100, 110 degrees. Now, dry climates, you know, the causes of these deserts and steppes are in the low latitudes. You know, they coincide with dry, stable, subsiding air. So high pressure systems, again, we talked about this in chapters 16 and 18. So we have lots of high pressure. You get, you know, essentially nice weather, it doesn't rain much. The problem is, is it never rains in the desert hardly. Um, so you get that those um, high pressure systems that just sort of keeps the rain away. Now, mid latitude deserts and steppes, things like the Gobi Desert in Asia, those are due to their position deep inside a landmass. So what does that mean? It's far from any type of oceanic influence. So the ocean can't sort of moderate its, its temperature. Um, most of these are located in the Northern Hemisphere. Like I said, the Gobi Desert in Mongolia, China region is a great example of that. It's far away from the oceans, yet it is a, it is a desert. It's just situated such at the latitude and where the, the uh, the weather just doesn't allow for a lot of precipitations, so it's a very, very dry climate. So here's a, a really cool picture of the Earth. You can see, you know, Africa spans such a large distance going from north to south that it has both climates. It has the, the desert climate here at the top, the Sahara Desert, you have sort of those tropical near the equator and then when you get to southern Africa you get the Kalahari Desert so it has two deserts and um, the, the jungles in between because it covers such a, a big area going from north to south plus you have the Arabian Desert over here as well so there, there's a lot of desert going on in Africa <laughs> there's a lot 
Now, the mid-latitude um, humid climates with mild winters, and we know this, right? We all go to Florida. You know, well, I would love to go to Florida in the winter. I, I never can because I'm teaching. Um, but, you know, that's – think of Miami, right? Or, you know, Florida, you know, the Gulf Coast. That's where people go in the winter to get warm, right? And so they can get, you know, 70 degrees or higher even in January, let's say in Miami, but yet then in, in winter it can get really hot and humid. They have that humidity, um, but they have mild winters. Now, any kind of precipitation that forms is along what's called a front. You know, these storms sort of blow through. Now, up here in Wisconsin in January or February, we're more than likely going to get snow from that. But down in Florida, they're still getting thunderstorms. It's just too warm, obviously, to have snow down there, except in very rare instances, and that's usually along the panhandle of Florida, or they might get a freeze or something like that. But Florida almost never gets snow. Very rarely do they get snow. Now you have the marine west coast, right? So things like the, the western windward side of continents, like California. Um, you have onshore flow of ocean air, which moderates the temperature. So it doesn't get too hot. It doesn't get too cold. So you have those mild winters and cool summers. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why places like San Diego and L.A. Well, L.A. can get hot. L.A. is a basin or San Francisco. People flock to because the weather, for the most part, is really, really good. I mean, San Diego's weather is the best in the country, hands down. There's really no place like it. It's about 76 to 80 degrees almost every single day. It, it very rarely gets cold and it very rarely gets too hot in San Diego. Now you can get um, things like dry summer subtropics uh, where you get strong winter rainfalls. This is often called the Mediterranean climate. So in the Mediterranean, like places like Italy and uh, Greece and things like that, um, it, it's very dry in the summer actually, but in the winter they get lots of rainfall. Um, but you know, in the summer, they <laughs> get beautiful weather. So it, it's it's but it's typically overall a dry climate, even though you're surrounded by the Mediterranean Sea. It's just the way the weather patterns work in terms of the winds blowing on, um, offshore as opposed to onshore. Okay, so I have my camera turned off again for this particular slide, and you can see a comparison of the C-type climates. The C-type climates include humid subtropics, what would be uh, the marine west coast, and drier sub subtropics. Now, there, you know, there's it's kind of weird how this works. It, it very much depends on whether it's on the west side of a continent or the east side of the continent. Now, you can see in Gangzhou, China here, the uh, it, it sits on the east coast here. So the prevailing winds are from west to east going in this direction. So they get a much higher range of temperatures going from, you know, the mid 60s up into the upper uh, low 90s. And they get, you know, your typical rainfall in the uh, spring and summertime. Whereas in Sitka, Alaska, which is what's called CFB, that's a marine west coast type of um a marine west coast type of climate which is very prevalent in europe because there's no real barriers to to block the cool ocean breezes but what that does is it keeps it wet fairly fairly consistently all year but you'll notice there's much less variability in the temperature and it doesn't get nearly as warm depending on where you are. The ocean really does control the climate for these west coast, uh, west marine west coast climates, like west coast of Europe, England, France, those have that same type of climate. And then you can see Cape Town, South Africa, which is in the southern hemisphere, and so they get they too get um, they get quite a bit, a little bit more rain in what would be their winter months our summer months and um but a much you know it's a, they don't get a ton of variability very similar to the alaska one it's 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 a very narrow band of temperatures it's a bit on the warm side it's not cold but they don't get the huge fluctuations being right on the oceans the ocean dictates a lot of their weather
So now we're going to take a talk about the humid mid-latitude climates with severe winters. This is where we are in Wisconsin. So the average temperature of the coldest month is below 27 degrees, and the warmest usually exceeds 50 degrees. So we get some pretty crazy swings of weather here in, in, in Wisconsin or in this type of climate. Um, we can get, because it's controlled by land and not so much by the ocean, because we're pretty far from the oceans. And you'll notice too that this particular climate zone is completely absent in the Southern Hemisphere, which I explained earlier, because there's nowhere in the Southern Hemisphere that is anywhere not near an ocean, if that makes sense. Um, they, you don't have the big land masses like you do in North America or, or Eurasia to develop these type of climates. So let's look at the humid mid-latitude climates with severe winters, again, where we are. They're typically between 40 and 50 degrees north latitude in North America and Eurasia. Again, you have these large land masses that you don't have in the southern hemisphere, which allow for this type of climate. We have severe winter and summer temperatures. So we can get really cold here and we can get really hot here. And then we have high annual temperature ranges, like I just mentioned. I remember many years ago, I think it was like 1996, where we had you know, wind chills that never got above minus 26, like four or five days in a row. It was, those are the wind chills, but the air temperature was still like 15 below. It was really cold. And then you get those summers where you might have a few hundred degree plus days in a row. We don't get those very often, but they, we can still get them. You can also have precipitation that's greater in the summer than in the winter. We typically get more rain than we get snow, and that's just part of the deal. Um, you know, the, a lot of the moisture comes up from down south, uh, but in the winter, it's a little bit harder to do that because the weather patterns aren't quite the same. And then finally, the snow remains on the ground for extended periods. Well, obviously, because that's where we are. So in the winter, when it snows, typically it lasts for a while. It's not like it melts right away, where you might see that, let's say, in some place like Georgia or South Carolina or North Carolina, where they'll get some snow and everybody will be in a panic, and then it'll melt a day or two later. We have a tenant, we usually get snow, and then it, unless, if it's enough snow, it stays there uh, quite a while. Now, th this is, uh, you know, the subarctic uh, climates, you know, you have north of humid continental climate. That's where we are. So th this one's even further north than us, up in what would be Canada. Um, the largest stretch of continuous forests on Earth are in this particular climate. Again, think Canada, think Russia, places like that. Um, and you get those cold air masses that come down. That's what chills us off in the winter. So... Um, and then you get these frigid winters, but remarkably warm, but short summers. And again, a lot of Canada, northern Canada is like that. They'll get some really warm days in the summer. And then, man, the bottom drops out in the middle of winter and it gets super cold up there. Here's a couple of examples. So we have Chicago, which obviously, and you can see that bell-shaped curve there. Now, Chicago, is, you know, we're, they're only 90 miles south of us, so this is essentially Milwaukee as well. You could see they get roughly the same amount of precipitation most of the year. It doesn't vary wildly, all right, but the temperatures do. I mean, we got this huge spike in Ju July and August, and then the, sort of the, you know, it goes way back down on either end in both January, February, and Dece November, December. The same thing applies to Moose Factory, Ontario. Again, they get a bit more rain in the in the summer, as you can see here, but that bell curve is actually narrower, so it only gets warm for a very short period of time. Other than that, it's pretty cold. And not only that, the bottom of their bell curve, if you look down here, this is minus four degrees Fahrenheit. So it gets seriously cold down there in the winter. Now, the polar climates are just that. They're the polar climates, right? They're sitting at the top or the bottom of the world. Um, that's where you, you know, it n almost never gets above 50 degrees. It's enduring cold. And you wouldn't think so, but the polar regions really don't get that much precipitation. A lot of that has to do 
with the fact that because they're sitting at the extremes of the earth, the weather patterns don't allow sort of new precipitation, so to speak. A lot of the snow and ice pack that's there has been sitting there a long, long time. It doesn't snow up in the polar regions that much. So you have the tundra climate, which is treeless, all right, um, almost exclusively in the northern hemisphere. Again, there's not much land mass in the southern hemisphere to uh, that will allow for this. Um, you get severe winters and cool summers, and then an, uh, a high annual temperature range. So it might you might get those occasional warm days, but they're seriously far and few between. And the temperature swings are, are crazy. Then you have the ice cap, and that is where it never gets above freezing, right? In order to sustain that ice cap, it always the water has to be frozen, so it never gets above 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero Celsius. It's permanent ice and snow. So let's take a look at a couple of examples here. You have Point Barrow, Alaska, which is the most northern uh, city in North America sitting way up here <laughs> um, and you can see if you look at this the blue bar graph down here they don't get much precipitation down there they get very little precipitation it's just the based on the weather patterns the wind patterns just don't bring moisture into that area it's just perpetually cold and dry and then they will get the occasional warm day here in the summer you can see the swings but if you look at the tail end down here in January, that's minus 30. <laughs> that's really cold, right? That's very, very cold. And the same thing applies to Greenland here. You know, the, the green sitting over here. And you can see it gets seriously cold. I'm not quite sure, you know, obviously it's even colder in February than January, according to this. Um, but it gets very, very cold, and there's a small peak here, but for the most part, it's always cold there. Now, there are parts of the world that have super high mountains, and those mountains play a role in the weather and climate of that region. Now, it's usually colder and wetter um, than the adjacent lowlands, and you get very, very vastly different climate um, variations depending on which side of the mountains are on um, and things like that. So one side of the mountain might be lush and green, the other side is going to be a desert. So here you can see two different examples of highland. Uh, you, you have Phoenix, Arizona, which gets super hot, right, in the summer because it sits sort of in a basin, it's at a lower elevation. And then right up the road, you have Flagstaff, Arizona, but because Flagstaff sits at a higher elevation, it still gets warm, but it doesn't get nearly as warm. And um, you have a, a much uh, cooler overall climate for that particular region, even though they're only you know, a couple, maybe a hundred miles apart, I forgot how far apart they are but it, it all has to do with elevation changes. Okay, so let's turn our attention now to humans' impact on the global climate. Now, humans have been modifying the environment for thousands of years with fires to, you know, whether it be, you know, just burning things to get rid of them, like, you know, garbage, or to clear land for farms, things like that, overgrazing. Humans have made an impact since day one on our Earth, and now we're starting to understand sort of the implications of, uh, of those actions. Now, global warming, or what we call climate change now, is where the water vapor and carbon dioxide absorb the heat and are largely just responsible to create this greenhouse effect in the atmosphere. So basically what happens is the sun rays are coming in and the carbon dioxide sort of traps it in a layer that doesn't allow it to escape out. And that raises the overall temperature of the earth. Now, the reason this has been accelerated over the last century or so is because of fossil fuels, combustible engines, you know, burning fossil fuels 
adds lots of carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide into the atmosphere and that reacts with the water vapor to create this sort of layer of greenhouse gases that don't allow the earth, it doesn't allow that energy from the sun to get back out. It kind of keeps it there warming our planet. So here's a kind of a disturbing graph that shows you the, the concentration of CO2 or carbon dioxide in parts per million. And for 650,000 years, atmospheric carbon dioxide was never higher than roughly 300 parts per million until, <laughs> until, you know, you know, roughly the last, you know, 20, 30 years, 40 years. Um, and all of a sudden it begins to shoot up like that. Now there, you know, there were a lot of theories about this and there are still skeptics and, you know, the science hasn't been proven per se, but everything seems to be implicate the fact that humans on some level are making this um, change because if you think about that graph, you see 1950 there, back in 1950, there were cars, but there weren't nearly as many cars as there are today. Now there's well over a billion cars pumping this stuff into the atmosphere. I'm just using cars as an example. There's also more factories, more coal burning plants, more everything that's spewing this stuff into the atmosphere. But cars are the easiest one to um, uh, understand because the more people you have on earth, you know, back in 1950, there were probably two to three billion people. Now there's seven. So with all those people means more cars and more everything else. Now the human impact is, you know, this atmospheric response to what's going on is that overall the global temperatures have increased. Now, this is where people go, well, it's not warmer where I am. No, that's weather, that's not climate. So the idea is, is that overall, if you took an average of all the temperatures around the world, they've all collectively gone up by a certain amount, not by a lot, but by enough to be start uh, having implications like melting the polar ice caps and things like that. And it's projected right now to increase even more as we go down the road, unless of course we could figure out a way to mitigate that. So here you can see a graph that shows the temperature differences going all the way back to 1880. And you know, the squiggles represent that you're gonna have highs and lows within a year. And then you're gonna have variability from year to year, but you can see there's definitely a trend upward, especially starting around 1980. That if you take that graph and look at it in the, the image on the bottom, you can see that much of the temperature differences are sort of pronounced in the Northern Hemisphere. You know, this area up on top here is where uh, the bulk of the heating is, you know, the, the, the temperature has gone up considerably because that's where the bulk of the people on Earth live is in the Northern Hemisphere. All of that CO2 is being pumped into the atmosphere and it kind of stays there. It's very difficult with the wind patterns being the way they are to get it from the Northern Hemisphere to the Southern Hemisphere. Now, there's these things called trace gases and these are the types of things that are playing a huge role in what's going on today uh, with our atmosphere being um, oversaturated with pollutants that cause these issues. Things like methane. What is methane? Well, we have lots of cows on earth, right? And lot, those cows produce lots of gas and that gas is called methane. Along, and it's not, that's gas from cows. Methane is also produced from things like wetlands and things like that, decomposition of organic matter. You have nitrous oxide, which is another huge problem. Again, this comes mainly from factories and from cars. Then you have chlorofluorocarbons, which for the most part have been uh, outlawed, but this is what caused the big hole in the ozone layer, which has been um, repairing itself quite well. It's back to almost 80% of what it was before. But all of these absorb wavelengths of uh, energy that taken together, they prevent that energy from getting back out into space. So it, it creates sort of this barrier layer, the image that radiation from the sun comes in, it bounces back up and then just gets stuck. 
like I mentioned with the carbon dioxide, these all play a role with this with different wavelengths of energy. The bulk effect of this is that the energy is not allowed to get back out into space and instead is collectively gathered close to the surface, increasing our temperatures. So when you're talking about global climate change, you have to th think of it as what's called a climate feedback mechanism. And there's two possible outcomes. This feedback mechanism is how everything interacts with each other, either as a um, to amplify something or to counterbalance it. It's one or the other. So if you have a positive uh, feedback mechanism, it reinforces the initial change, sort of makes it worse, that amplification. And a negative feedback mechanism produces results that are just the opposite of the initial change and tend to offset it or counterbalances it. So let's use sea ice as a feedback mechanism. So what this essentially means is that it's sort of a circular argument. When one thing starts to occur, it sort of snowballs uh, effect occurs. So let's start with reduced reflectivity. So what that means is the albedo of reduces. So when the sun's energy comes in, it's not allowed to reflect most of that light back out into space. Now, when you have a light surface like ice, that's typically what happens. But when that's reduced, now you move into the next phase, which is increased absorb absorption excuse me, of solar radiation. That means more of that uh, solar radiation is being absorbed into the water because there's a little less ice reflecting it back. That then warms the ocean. So you get a warmer ocean. Well, now that the war, ocean's a little bit warmer, and we're talking not, you know, it's warmer, but not a lot necessarily, you get a longer melt period. You get a longer period where there's active melting taking place. Then you have the decline, because there's a longer melt period, you go all the way to the top there, you get a decline in the perennial ice cover. Now you have less ice, now you have, and you go back around this loop. So it's a closed loop system. Now you have reduced reflectivity and you get the idea. It keeps going and keeps going. And the problem is, is if some of these uh, feedback mechanisms aren't allowed to sort of break, this is where you'll see that, you know, all of the sea ice is going to be melted and sea levels rise and things like that is because of these feedback mechanisms. Now, how do scientists look at global climate? Well, you can't just look at Wisconsin's weather and just go, well, that's, you know, well, we had a warmer winter, so it must be global warming. No, it doesn't work that way. These are based on physics and chemical principles, and they simulate future change with a range of possible outcomes. So no one particular model is necessarily the perfect one. What they're trying to do is get you know, see trends is as, as you change things, am I getting the same output over and over again? And this is what we call an iterative process. So you do it over and over again to sort of keep narrowing down to the point where you keep getting the same answer over and over and over again. Now, these are massive, massive models, computer models. They include variables such as temperature, rainfall, snow cover, soil moisture, wind, cloud, sea ice, ocean circulation. None of these are small in, in any way, shape, or form. Therefore, these models are run on the world's few, uh, fastest supercomputers. And there's several of them scattered around the world. And even on the world's fastest supercomputers, these models take sometimes days to complete. That's how big they are. Because again, you're taking these huge, you take any one of those variables, temperature, for example, that's a massive amount of data because we're talking about the entire world. Clouds, you know, that one's really weird because they can be cloudy one day and sunny the next day. So you're taking, you know, you have these huge, huge variables for a global scale. And now you're taking multiple of those, shoving them all into the world's fastest computers. Now, are they perfect? No, they're not perfect. But what they do is give a, a scientist a glimpse of what might happen if we don't change our current course. So let's take a look at some of the computer models. So if we look at just the observations, 
you can see that there is a trend in temperature going all the way back to the early 1900s that is trending up as you go along the timeline here. So it is going up. Now, if we look at just the natural forces, it should level out, right? I mean, if, if you took away all of the human influences, you know, the earth will correct itself and things will kind of even out over time, sort of averages itself. However, the problem is, is when you include models with both natural and human forces, you can see they mimic the observations that we're getting now. So things like CO2 emissions and nitrous oxide and chlorofluorocarbons that we mentioned earlier. When you add those into the model, as well as temperature and rainfall and all of those, you can see that the models start to mimic, again, the same upward trend that the observations do. So this is what leads scientists to believe that man is having a, uh, uh, a hand in, in changing global climate. Now, aerosols are a huge part of that. And in some parts of the world, you'll see that in the next slide, especially in ch places like China, there are these it, it causes massive health risk. So aerosols are tiny liquid or solid particles that get suspended in the air, all right? And th th these become an issue because they absorb uh, incoming solar radiation and sometimes they can cool, sometimes and they can heat up areas and they also are natural, some of them are naturally occurring or man-made and you inhale these. And you will see images sometimes of these aerosols. Now we think of aerosols, we think of a spray can, which is true. I mean, that is true. That is in the air and you can't breathe that in. But th this you can think of as tiny little dust particles that are um, na either naturally occurring or man-made, a lot of which is from things like factory smoke and things like that, byproducts of <clears throat> manufacturing. And these things get in the air and create, you know, a lot of times we'd call it smog. You know, that, that's not exactly the same thing. This is actually worse than smog because it actually contains particles, which when breathed in can cause serious health effects. So here's an image of human generated aerosols, and this is China. Now we all know, it seems like everything's made in China. And you know, China's gone through their industrial revolution, similarly to the US did back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And uh, while we still emit a lot of emission, uh, pollution, our pollution is not nearly as much as what's going on right now in China. And you could see that it just in the aerosol index alone. There's some serious aerosols, especially around this area. This is a huge manufacturing area. And you can even see it in satellite form where it gets so thick sometimes that it's hard to see the midday sun. Imagine that, this isn't fog, this is man-made um, particulates in the, in the atmosphere that, be, that generates such a thick cloud that you, can't, you can barely see the sun. It's really nasty stuff. Maybe some of you remember, but um, when the Olympics were in Beijing, there was a huge, huge um, problem. And a lot of the world was like, hey, you know, we want to bring our top star athletes, but your atmosphere in Beijing is is really nasty and they don't want to be breathing that air in. And China did a, I don't remember exactly what they did, but they they set up a whole bunch of things around the city to help clean their air. In fact, they put more, they, they made, uh, put moratoriums on certain things to help clean the air during the Olympics. So what are some of the possible consequences of global warming? Well, you might have seen these on the news or, you know, <laughs> portrayed in movies and things like that. Um, but one of them that you don't hear about necessarily that could play a huge role in, especially with humans, um, is the altered distribution of war, the world's water resources and the effect of productivity on agricultural regions. We actually have a faculty member at UWM who studies this type of phenomenon. So if you raise the temperature of the, the global average temperature by one degree, how does that affect how the plants grow, their length of growing season and things like that? So you have evaporation, which is the, the sun evaporating water. You also have what's called transpiration, 
evapotranspiration, which is what the plants release back into the atmosphere, which is important to us because that that helps, you know, it helps with oxygen content and things like that. So if you raise the 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 overall temperature of the earth, how is that going to affect how plants are going to evapotranspirate back into the into the atmosphere? And it, it's it's a, a huge question, obviously, but it's one that doesn't get all of the press like sea level rise and things like that. Now, that's the next one is the rise in global sea level. There are many, many parts of the world that if uh, as the polar ice caps melt due to global warming or climate change, that you know they'll start to be underwater you know places especially like florida is a perfect example because florida is only you know 10 20 feet above sea level so if you start to raise sea level uh places like miami and things like that a lot of florida is going to be uh affected by that you also have changing weather patterns and you know you see this and you know it's in it's weird you'll have a higher frequency and intensity of hurricanes now that's weird because like i think it was last year two years ago we had one of some of the fewest named hurricanes ever it's weird how you know once you think you have it figured out earth throws you a curveball but on a on an average you're going to get more intense storms um, and then the changes of frequency and heat waves and droughts. And we've seen that in certain parts of the world, too, where, you know, places that may have not have gotten a ton of precipitation are now bone dry and lakes are drying up and things like that at an accelerated rate. So here's a couple of graphs showing sea level change from 18 70 to 2000 and um, turn my camera um, and from 1993 to 2012 and you can see the global trend is to go up and that's the whole it, it the, the thing about that is is how steep it's going up it's been accelerated since about 1993 all right so this is what you know the the, the world is looking into now you know there's you know thousands of scientists working on this problem um there's legislation both from you know the u.s you know local regional the u.s and at a global scale of how to mitigate and minimize the effects or sort of at least slow it down and obviously a huge part of that is you know uh you know gas fossil fuel consumption which is still you know huge amounts of fossil fuels every year but also every year on the flip side of that, there's more and more alternative energy being used. We just haven't gotten to that tipping point yet where there's more alternative energy being used than uh, fossil fuels. There are a few places um, that actually have gotten to that point. I believe the Netherlands or Denmark, and I always forget which, which one it is, actually um, produces more alternative energy uh, than it does uses using fossil fuels. So they're becoming what would be considered carbon neutral or even carbon negative um, as a whole country. Now that it's that's going to be a ways off in our country because we rely so heavily on cars in the U.S. But in other parts of the world, there have been huge strides made in sort of weaning off uh, fossil fuels, especially as sort of like the um, uh, electricity generation. You know, cars are cars, they're not going anywhere quite yet, but getting away from the coal burning uh, plant, you know, electricity plants, more towards wind energy, solar energy, and even nuclear energy to a certain extent, which is still cleaner than coal. It just has its own side effects. Okay, so that's chapter 20. I hope you uh, learned something and I'll see you on the next one. Take care.